Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Trinity Hill Church. My name is Kyle Sanders. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Our other pastor is heading up on stage. He will be part of the music team this morning. So thank you, Pastor Arlen, and thank you, rest of the music team, for, for all that you do and for leading us in worship today. Thanks to the tech team as well for setting everything up. Uh, and, and welcome to uh, folks tuning in online. Great to have you with us. Uh, I happen to know we have some folks tuning in from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and from Sioux City, Iowa this morning. So great to have you uh, with us, and I'm, I imagine there's people from some other places as well. Uh, wonderful uh, to gather together as God's people in worship. Uh, buckle up, we have a bunch of announcements, so I'm going to try to go through them kind of fast. Uh, we have our daily Lent readings that are happening every weeknight on our Facebook page. Uh, that They go up at 7 p.m. every night. Uh, just a couple of minutes, and you can, you can tune in right at 7 or any time after that. Just spend a couple of minutes listening to God's Word. So that'll happen uh, every uh, Monday through Friday for the rest of Lent. Um, also this week, uh, Pastor Arlen and Susan will be leading an online Bible study, and that happens on Arlen's Facebook page. So head over to the Arlen Copendryer Facebook page. That's on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And then following Bible study at 7.15 p.m. on Wednesday, well, we get together on Zoom uh, to have a time of fellowship and prayer. Usually half hour, maybe 45 minutes, just sharing what's going on in our lives and then spending a little bit of time uh, praying together. So that's on Zoom. Uh, the Zoom link goes out in the newsletter. Uh, if you don't get the newsletter or you miss it somehow, shoot me an email, kyle at trinityhillmn.org, and I'll get you the link and you can join us uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, we also have a couple of, looking ahead now to Good Friday and Easter, we have a Good Friday worship service here uh, on April 2, that's Good Friday, and that will be at 6.30 p.m. So everybody's welcome to join us here, 6.30 p.m. for Good Friday worship. And then that Sunday, April 4, is Easter Sunday, and we're really looking forward to Easter worship, and we're really uh, making an effort to promote uh, the service and do some advertising and that sort of thing. Uh, we're really thankful that uh, just recently the governor, uh, you know, sort of got rid of the occupancy restrictions for churches, and we have a really big space, and we're still going to social distance and wear masks and all that, but we'll be able to spread out in this really big space. So uh, next week, we are printing out some door hanger flyers that we're going to distribute to the neighborhood around, right around us here in Chanhassen. So uh, if anybody has a little bit of extra time after worship next Sunday... We would love it if you could give us a hand, and we'll just give you a stack of flyers, and you can go walk the neighborhood for however much time you have and hang some, some door hangers uh, at, at people's houses. That way we can just get the word out about who we are and invite them to worship for Easter Sunday. The other thing that we'll be doing, and you guys, you guys can watch for this in your emails, we're going to be putting together a little Facebook post, uh, a little image that is an invitation for Easter worship. We'll send that out to everybody, and we'll, we'll be posting it on Facebook and everything. And what you can do is take that Facebook post and post it on your wall as a way of sort of inviting people to come and, and join us for Easter worship. Uh, you can even tag your friends. If you think there's somebody who might be particularly interested in, in joining us, you can put it on your wall and tag them and, and let them know that that's happening. So, of course, the old-fashioned ways of word of mouth and just inviting your friends and family, those are still good as well. So... Uh, really looking forward to gather here together for worship on Easter, April 4. Did I miss anything? There's a lot. Are the Vikings playing? I think, that I, no, is it, I think it's football season, isn't it? I don't but know. The Twins are playing soon. The Twins, yes, baseball and season their, is... their pitching rotation looks pretty good. It's looking, it's looking better and better. There's always hope for the Twins in March, by July. By July, the hope has dwindled. <laughs> it has dwindled. There you go. All right, with all of that said... Let me say that it is good to be gathered together to worship our God, and God who delivers us, who continues to guide us, and who promises to bring us through, to bring us home. This is the God who welcomes us and gathers us this morning. So please rise for God's greeting. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Would you take a moment and just wave or bump elbows with those near you, and then we'll join together in singing. <laughs> Oh, 
We pray. 
One of the great gifts that God gives us, you may be seated. One of the great gifts that God gives us is the opportunity to come clean, to abandon all self-renewal projects, and to admit that we have fallen and we can't get up. It is the great truth of the Christian faith that at the center of our faith is a word called sin. In an amazing moment in American history, it happened this week. A columnist named David Brooks for the New York Times wrote a column on the genius of the Christian concept of sin. I'm serious, that really happened. Brooks is, in his books, he will admit that he is not a believer, but he admires the Christian faith very much, and he feels magnetically pulled in that direction. In other words, one can pray for that David Brooks becomes a believer. In any case, sin prevent, the concept of sin, the confession of sin, prevents us from being secular people. We recognize that we have a relationship with God, and that relationship uh, is based on walking uh, in a covenant faithfulness with him. But we don't always do it. We think things we ought not think, say things we ought not say, do things we ought not do, and perhaps most of all, things that we ought to do, we don't do. And so we have a moment now where we confess our sin together. Uh, in my prayer, I'll leave a few moments of silence. Uh, you can just just remain silent. You don't have to say anything but it's an opportunity for you to say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Pray with me, please. Great God and Heavenly Father, you are holy. You are sinless. You are perfect in all that you do. You are right and righteous. We give you praise because you are a great and loving God. Your love endures forever and it never fails. Your faithfulness extends to every corner of the universe, and it never fails, and we praise you for that. Father, we are dust. We, uh, we sin. We do things that uh, break the shalom that you intend for your universe. We, break, we do things that, that disrupt community and are self-centered. Forgive our self-centeredness, forgive our greed, our lust, our, our sloth even in our unwillingness to serve you. Father, hear each of us now in these few quiet moments as we confess our sins to you. Turn your ear to us, O God. Turn your ear to us through the cross. Let the cross be the filter through which our words come to you. See us through what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our plea does not rest in our New Year's resolutions, but in his sacrificial atonement for us. We thank you for him. We thank you that you forgive our sins in him. That as far as the east is from the west, you remove our sins from us. We praise you and thank you that we are new creations in Christ because of your great work through the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, your Son. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Hear these words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Friends at Trinity Hill, friends listening online and watching online, believe. Believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Today and each day, walk in newness of life. Reading for us uh, from Psalm 146 at, at Trinity Hill, we make a practice of trying to incorporate a lot of scripture into our service. And Mia, a high school student, is going to read Psalm 146 for us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. <clears throat> Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. 
Blessed are those who help, whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in their Lord, their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Mia. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to praise you. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as people who love you and to, uh, and to celebrate that you are a good God, that you have provided for us, that you have given us food to eat, homes to live in, uh, friends, who, friends and family who love us. Father, we thank you for all these gifts. We thank you for sunshine, something that we take so much for granted. We thank you for the change of seasons, of winter into spring. Father, we, we pray as, as so many in these United States prepare for the agricultural season, we ask that, that you bless the earth with rain and sunshine and that crops would prosper, that people would have food to eat, uh, that there would be abundance. We thank you for your provision for us. Lord, we thank you for um, the way that you have brought healing to so many we think again of Diana's uh, relative, a young woman, 15 years old, who has received a new heart, a heart transplant in Michigan. Father, continue to watch over Jenna. Uh, heal her, restore her, give her all that she needs, that she might be restored to full health. Lord, I, I pray for my sister Lonnie as she is uh, experiencing the ravages of brain cancer. Uh, Father, be with her, comfort her, comfort Don, her husband, and and their children and grandchildren watch over them. We pray for Susan's sister, Kathy, uh, as she also experiences a brain tumor. Father, watch over her and be with the physicians as, as they work with her. Uh, give her hope, uh, give her strength, and we pray uh, that that tumor would be shrunk and removed. You are the God who can heal. You can do that. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ around the world many of whom, and we, we, we pray this often, Lord, and we don't tire of praying it, they need you. They need your protection. For Christians who suffer for their faith in Nigeria, for Christians who suffer for their faith in the Middle East, in Turkey, Father, in China, Lord, watch over your people. Hold them in the palm of your hand. Prevent, prevent suffering and hostility. Uh, keep them safe. We pray that, that their witness to you would be effective on your behalf. Lord, we ask that uh, you watch over us here at Trinity Hill. We pray that you would bring our congregation back together soon. We thank you for the effectiveness of the vaccines, for the diminishing of the virus. We pray that that would continue. Uh, we thank you for that. Lord, uh, as we look to the Easter season, we pray that you'd help us as a church to reach out, to reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ and to invite people to this place and to all the churches in this area that proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. You can do this because you are the great king above all gods. You indeed are our great redeemer. You are in the business of making the old new, of transforming the broken, of healing the hurting. You are our great redeemer and we praise you and we thank you for that. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples and therefore your whole church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beautiful old Christian hymn. Some of you may have learned it uh, as I did, as guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Uh, that was kind of a cumbersome word, and we even learned in years later that, yeah, I won't get into the technicalities of it, but Jehovah is actually a misnaming of the word Yahweh. So we have changed the words to Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer, and it is still a really great hymn, and we're going to sing it together. Can you please stand? Thank you. 
be seated. Thank you, music team, for leading us. There is a reason that God's people have always been people who sing. There's a reason that throughout the ages when the church has gathered together, we sing songs of worship, songs of praise. And so this morning in our series that we're calling Morning to dancing, we're going to take a look at one of the earliest examples of God's people lifting up a song of worship and praise. It comes out of this incredible story in the book of Exodus. We're not going to read through the whole story, but I'll sum it up, and I encourage you to read it in Exodus 14, the crossing of the Red Sea. God has led his people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, out of their bondage, and he has called them now to camp out by the sea. And as they are camped there by the sea, suddenly they realize that Pharaoh's army is coming after them. And they see them off in the distance, and they realize that now that they've escaped slavery, they're stuck. And they've got the great waters of the sea on one side, and they've got Pharaoh's army coming after them on the other, and they are terrified. But God has a plan to not only deliver his people Israel, but to put an end once and for all to their oppressors, the Egyptian army. And so God tells Moses to raise his staff up in the air and to to stretch out his hand over the water. And Exodus 14 tells us the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And after the Israelites had crossed through the sea, God calls Moses to again stretch out his hand over the water. And it says, the water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, none of them survived. And so on that day, the Israelites were delivered from the hands of their enemies. Never again would they face the harsh oppression of slavery in Egypt. They were free. God had delivered them. And so as they're on the shore, on the other side of the sea, the Israelites break out into song, this song of praise, and it's recorded for us in Exodus 15. And I'm going to read it for us now, and the words will be on the screen so you can follow along. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. 
I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks to God. So Moses and Miriam and the Israelites sing this song of praise to the Lord. This is their response to the great and wondrous deed that God has done in their midst. And there is a reason that God's people have always been people who sing when we gather to worship him as his people. There is something about singing that makes it a uniquely appropriate response to what God has done for us, his people. And so this morning, we're going to look uh, at two things. First, we're going to look briefly at why we sing. Why is singing so important? What is it about singing that makes it this appropriate response? And then secondly, we're going to talk about what we sing. And we're going to take our cues from the song we just read as we, as we talk about the content of the songs of God's people. So why do we sing? And what do we sing as God's people? Why do we sing? Well, there's a lot of reasons that we sing. I'm going to talk about one. God's people sing because singing helps us remember. It helps us remember the truth of who our God is and what he has done for us. Singing helps us remember. We all know this, that if you want to remember something, it helps to put it in a sort of a song. How did you learn the alphabet? You sing a song. You don't just memorize, okay, A, B, C. You sing the ABCs because it helps remember. I wrote about this in the newsletter. Several years ago, I was working at an after-school center. Kids ages first through eighth grade. And we had a goal that year that every kid, 100% of kids, would be able to identify all of the continents and all of the oceans on a world map. That was our goal, 100%. So we needed a baseline. And we, and we had the kids take a test at the beginning of, of the year. And I don't remember what the number was. It wasn't 100%. We had a little ways to go. And we worked on it, and we worked on it, and we worked on it. And then we, give the, we gave the kids another test. And this time, 100%. 100% of all kids got 100% of continents and 100% of oceans correctly identified. Because we taught them a song. We taught them a song. They, we sang, and it incorporated all the continents and all the oceans. And as we sang it, I was up there on the stage. We had a big world map up there on the screen, and I was up there pointing you know, at all the continents as we went through. As soon as the kids learned the song, they could all identify the continents and the ocean. We had 100%. We sing in worship because it helps us remember the truth of what we sing. There's a, 
a Christian philosopher named James K.A. Smith, and he's done some thinking about music as it relates to worship, and this is what he writes. He says, music gets in us in ways that other forms of discourse rarely do. A song gets absorbed into our imagination in a way that mere texts rarely do. Indeed, a song can come back to haunt us almost, catching us off guard or welling up within our memories because of situations or contexts that we find ourselves in, then perhaps spilling over into our mouths till we find ourselves humming a tune or quietly singing. And it's true, singing gets in us. It gets into our imagination and into our memory. It's very possible that today, after worship, you'll be at home this afternoon, and mysteriously, one of the songs that we sang this morning will come back to you, and you might even start humming it and singing it. You know what's not going to happen this afternoon? You're not going to suddenly start reciting passages of this sermon. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how good the sermon is. And it's not that the sermon is unimportant. It's just that it doesn't get in us the, quite the same way that music does. And that's why singing is so important. That's why we sing together. A way, it's a way of getting that truth in us. One final note on this why we sing. It's related. We, one of the reasons we sing when we get together is so that we as God's people can be united together as we sing together and that we can encourage one another. That when we sing, we're singing to God and we're worshiping him, but we're also hearing all the voices of our brothers and sisters singing with us and reminding us of this truth, of what we sing. Last May, uh, Hannah's grandmother, my wife Hannah, her grandmother passed away. And this was end of May, early June. And so it was sort of the height of the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we had not been meeting in person for worship at all at that point. And, but the weather was getting nicer. It was warm enough that a small group of family could gather outside, and we, you know, we were socially distanced and all that, for, for a funeral service. And as part of the funeral, we sang a song together. And it was the first time in two or three months that I had heard other people singing together in a group. And I, and I still get goosebumps thinking about what that sounded like as we were encouraging one another even in our mourning and in our grief, encouraging one another of who our God is and what he has done for us. Singing together is so important. So that's why we sing, or it's at least one reason that we sing. But what do we sing? What is the content of our song? What are the themes of the songs of God's people? We're going to take a look at a couple of themes that we get from Exodus 15. These are not the only themes that we sing as God's people but they're important ones, and they are themes that we have sung through the ages as God's people. So first, we sing the song of God's deliverance. We sing the song of God's mighty act of deliverance and bringing us into salvation. We see this right at the beginning of the song, just these first few verses. Moses sings, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted both horse and driver he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. We're going to pause there a minute. God is our salvation. He is the one who delivers us out of our sin and into a new life in him. And I want to focus for a minute on those words. The Lord is my strength and my defense. We as God's people are people who know that our ultimate strength, our ultimate defense does not rest in us or in our human strength, it rests with the Lord and with his strength. And there's a, this incredible image from Exodus chapter 14. As the people are passing through the Red Sea, God is leading them. The, the, the pillar of cloud is going before them, leading them through the sea. But remember, the Egyptians are coming up behind them. And so there's this moment when, when God, in the uh, cloudy pillar, lifts up from in front of the people and places himself behind the people to stand between the Israelites and the Egyptians so that the Egyptians cannot catch up. The Lord is our defense. He goes before us to lead us, 
and he remains behind us to protect us. He is the one who stands between us and all of our enemies. The Lord is our strength. Singing that truth reminds us that when our human strength fails, when we are overwhelmed, when we have come to the end of ourselves, when it seems hopeless, singing that truth reminds us that we have somewhere to turn. We don't ultimately trust in our own strength. We're not ultimately left to figure things out on our own, to fix ourselves or the situations we're in. Our God is our strength. Moses continues singing, The Lord is a warrior. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The Lord delivers his people in dramatic fashion. As a warrior fighting on behalf of his people, he destroys their enemies. Now, to be honest, at this point, and I imagine I'm not the only one, I get a little uncomfortable with this warrior imagery, this language of a God who is a warrior. It's unsettling. There's some really gruesome imagery here. And I've talked with some other folks, and I know that this is an unsettling idea. I don't know about you, but I much prefer the places where God says things like, blessed are the peacemakers, and love your neighbor as yourself. And God does say those things. But here our God is a warrior. And I think that for those of us uh, who find ourselves uncomfortable with that imagery, let me just say that I think that there's something okay about that. It's okay that this is unsettling. And it's okay to wonder, what do we do with this? But I also wonder that if at least part of the reason we find this a little bit unsettling is that because in our relative comfort here in this country, and I'm not saying that we have things easy necessarily, but in our relative comfort and in our relative ease, we might find it hard to have a real appreciation of what we're really up against. Scripture tells us that we have an enemy, an enemy who seeks to work against us, an enemy that seeks to divide us, an enemy who seeks to make us into selfish people and miserable people, an enemy who wants to keep us bitter and angry with others, an enemy that wants nothing more than to keep us enslaved in our own sin and unable to get out of it. And so this image of the warrior God may be unsettling, but it also encourages us encourages us to think about what this means. Our God is a warrior who fights against our enemy. And the strongest forces of evil and oppression that our enemy seeks to work in our world and in our lives. We have a God who fights as a warrior against the oppression of injustice, against the oppression of racism, against the oppression of addiction and illness, against the oppression of, of the hatred and greed and selfishness that we find warring in our own hearts. Our God fights against that for us, to free us, and to deliver us from evil. Ultimately, we see that our God fights on our behalf by sending his son, Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, blessed are the peacemakers, and he said, love your neighbor as yourself. But in other places, he's described in warrior-like terms. Uh, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15 writes this, Then the end will come when Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And here's the kicker. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, death itself is defeated. Jesus fights against the powers of sin and evil so that death no longer gets the final word. Our sin is forgiven, defeated, gone, and we are invited into the promise of a new and full life in him, just as the Israelites led out of Egypt into a new and full life with God who bought them and loved them and protected them. And so, when we sing, we sing to remember our great and our mighty God, who like a warrior delivers us from sin and death. This is why we sing. 
as we did this morning, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Hail him who saves you by his grace. Crown him Lord of all. And in a few minutes, we're going to close in singing, proclaiming that our God is mighty to save, that he is the author of our salvation. And so we sing the song of God's deliverance. We also sing the song of God's continued guidance. The way he continues to lead us and guide us. And we see this in verse 13. Moses and the people sing, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling." You'll notice here, and especially if you read through this again in Exodus 15, you'll notice that up until this point, all of the verbs have been past tense. God did this for the people. God has delivered us from Egypt. And now, suddenly, in verse 13, verse 13 it switches to the future tense. In your unfailing love, you will lead your people. You will guide them. You will continue to go with them. Now the song is all about what God will continue to do for his beloved people. And if you keep reading past verse 13, that's where you get this list of, of all the rival nations that Israel is about to come across. They've, they've been freed from slavery in Egypt, but now they face a truly daunting future. The Philistines, uh, as we know from historical records, were, were more powerful and technologically advanced than the Israelites. And then if they get through the Philistines, they'll have Edom and Moab, and the people of Canaan, and the list goes on and on. And frankly, from a human perspective, Israel was a tiny nation. They were at their very beginning. They weren't a, a military powerhouse. They'd been slaves in Egypt. They don't stand a chance. But they didn't stand a chance against Egypt either. And the same God who delivered them from the Egyptians promises now not to leave them, not to say, hey, you're off on your own, but to guide them and protect them and empower them on the way forward. In times when the road ahead for us is daunting and uncertain, in times when things seem hopeless, God's people sing. We sing to remember that God himself will lead us as we move forward. And that is why we sing as we sang this morning, guide me, O thou great redeemer. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, ever be my strength and shield. So we sing the song of God's deliverance. We sing the song of God's guidance and continued leading. Finally, God's people sing the song of future hope. We are people who sing the song of future hope. We see this in verse 17. The people sing, you will bring them. You, O God, will bring your people in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. Here is the ultimate future hope for the people of Israel, that God will bring them to the place that he has promised them, that God will lead them and plant them on the mountain of his inheritance. In other words, God promises to bring his people home. And this is our future hope, that God is bringing us home. And so we are called to be the people who sing this song of hope. And we sing this song of hope with two horizons in mind. There's a closer horizon and a farther off horizon. And here's what I mean by that. The first horizon is a little more immediate. We sing this song of future hope as God's people here and now, as Trinity Hill Church, as the people that God has planted in this place and in this time, in the Southwest Metro of the Twin Cities in 2021. He is planting us here as his people. And I love that imagery of being planted because it suggests that God calls us to root ourselves here. And 
it suggests that we are called to grow and to flourish here as his people, to grow in our love for one another and in our knowledge of God's love for us and his grace for us. It's an image that suggests that we are called to then flourish and bear fruit in the community around us, sharing that love and that grace that God has for us in our neighborhoods and in our schools and in our places of work, to be people who serve, to be people who seek out the last and the least and the lost, and to share the good news of what God has done for us. That's the more immediate horizon. God is planting us here as a community to bear fruit. There's a farther off horizon as we sing this song of future hope, and that is that one day Christ will return to finally put an end to death, to make all things well, to restore all things. And in that day, we will be planted and established as his people in a new heavens and in a new earth. And the book of Revelation tells us that in that day, there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. And so we sing to help us remember and envision that future hope. And so we sing, as we sang last week, we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together. We will feast and weep no more. In that day, all our weeping will be done. For God has made all things new. And that is our future hope as his people. There's a worship leader from Houston uh, named Joe Deegan. And Uh, Joe Deegan was reflecting in an article about the importance of singing together as God's people. And he talks specifically about this future orientation of our singing. And this is what he writes. He says, the songs we sing in church not only connect us with our Christian past and present, but they also connect us with our future. When we gather and sing corporately, in other words, when we gather and sing together as God's people, we glimpse the glorious future when the people of God from every tribe, tongue, and nation will praise God with a thunderous roar we can't even imagine now. The goosebumps we can get now when we sing together in church are but a foretaste of what it will be like to worship our Savior face to face. And so we sing to remember that this is where we're headed. This is our future hope. At the end of our passage, Moses finishes the song, and then his sister Miriam immediately takes up the lead, and she begins leading all the women in song and in dance. And this shows us that the songs of God's people, the songs of deliverance, the songs of guidance, the songs of future hope, these are songs that are meant to be sung together. These are songs that are meant to be learned together, to be passed on and to be repeated to one another week in and week out throughout the generations so that we, as God's people, will know deep in our hearts who our God is, what he has done, and what he promises to do for us in our future, in our hope. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are the God who delivers us, that you are the God who continues to lead us and guide us even when things seem daunting and challenging. You are our strength and our defense. Lord, we give you thanks for the great future hope that you are a God who is making all things well and all things new. So Lord, we pray that you would give us uh, strength to continue singing your song, grant us the grace to uh, continue Uh, gathering together as your people and being encouraged by one another and remembering who you are and what you have done for us. And Lord, may we go out from this place, uh, planted in our communities, uh, to be witness to your love and your goodness to the people that you place in our lives. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Normally, this would be the time when we take up our offering. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing that for health reasons. We're not passing the, the basket around, but we do have uh, baskets placed at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, you're invited to, to leave an offering or a gift there uh, as you leave the service this morning. 
Um, you can also give online. Uh, you just go to our website and there's a button there that says uh, giving or give now or something like that. You can sign up to give a gift, uh, one-time gift or a recurring gift, whatever works for you. Um, or you can mail a check to our PO box and you can see the, the address there on the screen. But I invite all of us to, to, um, to give generously and to live our lives generously as an act of worship uh, to our God. And now I invite you to stand and we're going to sing together Mighty to Save. This is Richard and Jamie and their new baby, Jesse. Jesse, yes. And we, I mean, I don't mean this in a bad way, but we haven't seen you in a while. 
I mean, we haven't seen you since Jesse was born, and it, there's like more of you. <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, we're very thankful for that. And you guys are going to have Jesse baptized soon. I mean, you told me. I'm not <laughs> surprised. No. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. That's awesome. How's it going? Yeah, we're certainly hanging in there. Um, we feel more comfortable now to go out and yeah. especially do stuff. But yeah. Ooh, I don't have my mask on. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let me pray for you a minute. This is, I mean, it's exciting. Nobody knew I was going to do this, including Kyle. But I saw you guys back there, and I thought, boy, we can't pass. How are you? Say, say his name again. Jesse. Jesse. How old is Jesse? Jesse is a little over four months now. Cool. Is your middle name James? Lee. Uh, Lee, okay. Is it Jesse <laughs> Lee? Really? Jesse Lee. Yeah. Is that a family name? Oh, uh, yeah. My dad had it. I have it. And now Jesse has now it. Now Jesse has it. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesse Lee, and thank you for Richard and uh, for Jamie. Father, I pray that you continue to bless this new family. Thank you for bringing them here this morning. Uh, Lord, we look forward to the day uh, when Jesse can be baptized. Uh, this is just an exciting thing, and we're so thankful for it. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, asking you to walk with this young family. Amen. Thanks for being spontaneous and letting me bring you up here. Today. All right. Okay. <laughs> That's actually very appropriate because our reading is from Colossians 3, and it's about giving thanks. And uh, Jesse is, and Jamie and Richard are among the things we're very thankful for. From Colossians 3, 15 through 17, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now I invite you to receive God's parting benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Savior, he can.